Hi friends, welcome to my channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts. And I am Dr. Srinivas, Neurologist from Andhra Pradesh. Today, I will be talking a very important topic, stroke, which is not only useful for practice, but also from, for exams. In fact, Dr. C. M. Fisher, a great neurologist, said that, Neurology is learnt stroke by stroke and therefore if you learn the stroke syndromes, the stroke by stroke, you are learning neurology. So today I am going to talk about all these stroke syndromes and a very interesting rule, the rule of four. But what is stroke? Stroke or cerebrovascular accident is defined as an abrupt onset of a neurological deficit which is attributed to a focal vascular cause. As I said, it is because of vascular cause. So to understand the stroke syndromes, we need to understand the vascular anatomy. Basically, we can divide stroke syndromes into cortical syndromes and the brainstem syndromes that is midbrain, pons and medulla oblongata. But to understand that, we need to understand circle of villus. What is the circle of villus? Circle of villus is an anastomosis which is formed between the vertebrobasilar system and the internal carotid artery system. So circle of villus is formed by anastomosis of the vertebrobasilar system and the internal carotid artery system. If you understand the vascular anatomy, the vessels supplying each part of the brain, understanding stroke syndrome is very, very easy. And then at the end, I can summarize with a rule of four for the brainstem strokes. So the entire brain is supplied by the circle of villus, which is formed by the vertebrobasilar system and the carotid arterial system. The vertebrobasilar artery system and the strokes because of this we call that as posterior circulation stroke. So the vestibro basilar system supplying the brainstem, we call that as posterior circulation stroke. The internal carotid artery which predominantly supplies the cortex through MCA, ACA, we call that as anterior circulation stroke. Fortunately, anterior circulation strokes are more common than the posterior circulation strokes and this is good news why posterior circulation strokes are dangerous because they are basically brainstem strokes medulla oblongata pons midbrain are involved where you have vital structures the anterior circulation strokes are generally less dangerous as compared to the posterior circulation strokes so you have vertebro based our system you have carotid arterial system. Now just listen carefully. I just give important points. So the two vertebral arteries join together to form the basilar artery, divide into posterior cerebral arteries and then in circles supply the temporal cortex and the occipital cortex. So the medulla oblongata is predominantly supplied by the vertebral artery. So, if there is a medulla oblongata stroke, it is because of vertebral artery territory. The two vertebral arteries join together to form the basilar artery. That means pons is supplied by basilar artery. So, if there is any pontine hemorrhage or any involvement of the pons, it is because of the basilar artery. The basilar artery divides into two posterior cerebral arteries. That means midbrain is supplied by the posterior cerebral artery. It divides and circles the temporal lobe and the occipital cortex. So occipital cortex is supplied by the posterior cerebral artery. That's it. This is posterior circulation stroke. So just to recapitulate, the medulla oblongata is supplied by the vertebral artery. Pons is supplied by the basilar artery. The midbrain is supplied by the posterior cerebral artery. The temporal lobe, the thalamus and the occipital cortex are supplied by the posterior cerebral artery. Fine. Now let's come to the anterior circulation. The internal carotid artery gives rise to the middle cerebral artery. 
So the entire cortex is supplied by the middle cerebral artery. Then it divides into anterior cerebral artery. So the medial part of the frontal lobe is supplied by the anterior cerebral artery. So if you take the cortex, the entire cortex is supplied by the middle cerebral artery except the medial part of the frontal lobe which is supplied by the anterior cerebral artery and the occipital cortex which is supplied by the posterior cerebral artery. So if you have understood this, the overview of circle of willis, now understanding stroke syndromes are very very easy. So now let's go step by step. First I will talk about cortical syndromes, then the brainstem syndromes. So cortical syndromes, first predominantly we have middle cerebral artery territory. So middle cerebral artery territory, we have superior division and the inferior division. So if an embolus lodges into the middle cerebral artery superior division, on the left side, the Broca's area is affected. So patient will have Broca's aphasia and right hemiplegia. If an embolus lodges into the inferior division of the middle cerebral artery on the left side, patient will have Wernicke's aphasia. That means he does not understand, he keeps on talking. Person who have Wernicke's aphasia usually will not have hemiplegia, very important point. Because Wernicke's area is in the temporoparietal area. Whereas corticospinal tract comes from the frontal area, internal capsule, midbrain, pons, medulla and goes to the opposite side. So, if an embolus lodges into the superior division, it affects the frontal lobe, they will have Broca's aphasia with hemiplegia. Whereas if an embolus lodges into the inferior division, they will have Wernicke's aphasia, but they usually will not have hemiplegia. On the right side, the MCA gets affected, the superior division, they may have hemineglect and if the inferior division gets affected, they may have visual field defects. So this is about the middle cerebral artery, the superior division and the inferior division. Now let's see what happens if the stem of the middle cerebral artery gets affected. If the stem of the middle cerebral artery gets affected, they will have hemiplegia, they will have hemisthesia they will have global aphasia because the superior division is also affected the inferior division is also affected they will have global aphasia and importantly they may have gaze deficits that means if left frontal lobe is affected left frontal eye field is affected they cannot move the eyes towards the right side the saccadic part is affected so eyes will look to one side and hemiplegia on the opposite side so frontal lobe lesions MCA infarcts there can be gaze palsy, eyes looking to one side and hemiplegia on the opposite side. Whereas if pons gets involved, the PPRF has already crossed. So when the PPRF gets affected, eyes cannot be pulled towards its side. Eyes will move towards the opposite side. Hemiplegia is also on the opposite side. So eyes will be looking towards the side of hemiplegia in a pontine lesion. Whereas if it's a dense MCA, stem of the MC infarct, eyes will a frontal lobe infarct, eyes will be looking to one side and hemiplegia towards the opposite side. This is all what you know, what you should know about middle cerebral artery. Right. Now let's come to the anterior cerebral artery. As I said, the internal cavity artery divides into middle cerebral artery and the anterior cerebral artery. So the anterior cerebral artery predominantly supplies the medial part of the frontal lobe. So in the medial part of the frontal lobe, according to the motor homonicles, you have the leg area. So if both the anterior cerebral arteries get affected, the legs get affected, the legs become weakened. So weakness of leg is more in favor of the anterior cerebral artery, whereas weakness of the face and the hand more than the leg is in favor of the middle cerebral artery. So if the anterior cerebral artery gets affected, they will have leg weakness, they will have primitive reflexes because frontal lobes are affected they will have emergence of the primitive reflexes. What are primitive reflexes? The grasp reflex, sucking reflex, all these reflexes are present during our infancy. When the frontal lobe isn't that mature. But once the frontal lobe starts maturing after we pass the infancy stage, these reflexes have to disappear. But the re-emergence of these reflexes shows that the frontal lobe is getting affected. So, emergence of the primitive reflexes, the leg area getting affected, patient having behavioral changes and if the left ACA gets affected, they will have transcortical motor aphasia. 
it's it's akin to motor aphasia broca's aphasia but repetition is intact because perisylvan area is intact so left aci involvement they can have transcortical motor aphasia so now what are the signs of aci involvement anticipatory involvement the leg gets affected because the medial part of the frontal lobe is affected they have the emergence of the primitive reflexes because the frontal lobe is affected they'll have behavioral changes they will have transcortical motor aphasia. This is about the anterior cerebral artery. Now let us see posterior cerebral artery. As I said, the posterior cerebral artery supplies the midbrain, winds around the temporal lobe and the occipital lobe. So the temporal lobe also can get affected. They can have memory disturbances. They can have the visual pathway getting affected, visual field effects. Primarily the occipital cortex gets affected. If the occipital cortex gets affected, there is cortical blindness, Anton syndrome. They can have visual agnosia, a perceptive agnosia, associative agnosia. So, parietal occipital means where they cannot identify. If occipital temporal is affected, it is what? That means they can identify, but they cannot give meaning to it. So, you call that as apperceptive agnosia if occipital parietal area gets affected. And if occipital temporal area gets affected, you call that associative agnosia. They can identify, but they cannot give meaning to it. Example, prosopagnosia. They can identify the face as face, but they cannot give meaning to the face. Then you have the thalamus getting affected, posterior cerebral artery. You can have hemisensory loss. Then you have the splenium of the corpus callosum gets affected. You have alexia without agnosia, without agraphia. Alexia without agraphia means difficulty in writing, but whatever they written, that is difficulty in reading and difficulty in writing. Alexia without agraphia, they can write, there is no difficulty, but they cannot read what they have just written. The principle being, the right sided vision, the right sided vision goes into the left occipital cortex, the left sided vision goes into the right occipital cortex. Anything on the right side is easy to convert into language form because it goes to the left occipital cortex, and my language areas are on the left, so it is easy to access. But anything on the left which goes to the right occipital cortex needs the spinium of the corpus callosum and corpus callosum to travel and access the language areas. So any defect in the spinium of the corpus callosum, it cannot traverse and therefore it cannot access language areas and therefore they have problems. So alexia without agraphia, they don't have problem with writing but they can't read what they have just written. There is no problem in writing because it goes slightly anterior. So this is all about posterior cerebral artery strokes. So we have MCA strokes, we have ACA stroke, we see a PCA stroke. Now, most important especially from MB based point of view to some extent MD internal medicine point of view is about internal capsule. Internal capsule you need to know two things. One the blood supply, second the structures which are affected. Internal capsule you have the anterior limb, genu, posterior limb, retrolenticular part and sublenticular part. So you have anterior limb, geno, posterior limb, retrolenticular part, sublenticular part. The internal capsule, the blood supply you can divide into two halves. One the entire upper part and then two the entire lower part. The entire upper part of internal capsule is supplied by the middle cerebral artery. So the entire upper part of the internal capsule is supplied by the middle cerebral artery. The lower part of the internal capsule, you divide it into three parts. The anterior most part is supplied by the AC, the anterior cerebral artery, a branch of which is Huebner's artery. So, in the internal capsule, if you take the anterior limb, they have the thalamic radiation sensory and then come the corticobulbar fibers and the corticospan fibers which are more in the genu and the posterior limb and therefore in the anterior third if the anterior cerebral artery Huebner's artery gets affected the corticobulbar fibers are predominantly affected so they will have facio brachial monoplegia 
So anterior cerebellar artery which supplies the lower part and anterior one third if it gets affected, humerus artery, anterior cerebral artery if it gets affected, they will have facio-brachial monoplegia. Then you have genu, then the posterior limb. So anterior one third is supplied by the anterior cerebral artery branch of which is humerus artery, the middle one third by the posterior communicating artery and the posterior one third again by AC. This is anterior choroid artery, a branch of internal carotid artery. So corticobulbar fibers are, everything is in the posterior part. The anterior part has got only thalamic radiations. The posterior part will have corticobulbar fibers and corticospinal fibers. So if the posterior most part gets affected, which is supplied by the anterior choroidal artery, a branch of internal carotid artery, corticospinal fibers are affected. So they will have hemiplegia. They can have hemisensory loss and then they will have visual disturbances, homonymous hemianopia. Why? Because you have anterior limb, geno, posterior limb, retrolenticular, sublenticular. Anterior limb you have thalamic radiations, geno you have corticobulbar fibers and posterior limb you have corticospan fibers. So the anterior thalamic radiations get affected. The thalamic radiations get affected, you will have hemisthesia. If the genu and the posterior limb get affected, you have corticobulbar fibers and corticospan fibers getting affected, you have hemiplegia. And if the retrolenticular part gets affected, you have optic radiations. So they have homonymous hemianopia. The sublenticular is auditory radiations. So if a person has got hemiplegia, hemianesthesia, and homonymous hemianopia, it is because of the anti anterior choroidal artery of internal carotid artery involvement. So very very important. Hemiplegia, hemisthesia, homonymous hemianopia. It is anterior choroidal artery involvement. Even in the MCA territory also you can have hemiplegia, hemisthesia and homonymous hemianopia. But then they have other signs like global aphasia. They can have gaze palsy. So other cortical signs are there like gaze palsy or global aphasia, then it is more of cortical lesion. Whereas in internal capsule, you don't have cortical signs like gaze palsy or global aphasia. You have purely hemiplegia, hemisthesia, homonymous hemianopia. Hemisthesia because of the anterior thalamic radiations involvement in the anterior limb of the internal capsule. The genu and the posterior limb are involved, which carries corticobulbar and corticospinal fibers. So they'll have hemiplegia. And then the retrolenticular part, you have optic radiations. They have homonymous hemianopia. So internal capsule, the blood supply, the parts, the structures passing through it are very, very important. And very important point to note is that internal capsule involvement, a small deficit can produce a dense semiplegia because corticobulbar fibers and corticospinal fibers are so close. So small lesion in the internal capsule can produce a dense hemiplegia where the cortical lesions unless it is big it does not produce a dense hemiplegia so even a small infarct can produce a dense hemiplegia so important points to be remembered in internal capsule are one if the anterior cerebral artery a branch of which is humerus artery if it gets affected usually the anterior limb and genu are more commonly affected and they'll have facio brachial monoplegia whereas if anterior choroidal artery branch of internal carotid artery is involved is involved the posterior part gets involved so you have hemiplegia hemisthesia and homonymous hemianopia because you have retrolenticular fibers where there are optic radiations so this is about internal capsule now let's come to the brain stem strokes you have midbrain pons and medulla oblongata in midbrain Basically, you have Northangel syndrome where the superior cerebellar peduncle is affected. So, they will have cerebellar ataxia. You have Benedict syndrome where the red nucleus gets affected. So, you will have tremors and hemiplegia. Claude syndrome is nothing but Northangel syndrome and Benedict syndrome. So, they will have cerebellar ataxia. They will have tremors and hemiplegia. Finally, you have Weber syndrome where the third nerve is involved. So third nerve with hemiplegia is Weber syndrome. So non-angle syndrome is superior cerebellar peduncle where you have cerebellar ataxia. Benedict syndrome is red nucleus where you have tremors. Claude is north angles plus Benedict. So you have tremors and cerebellar ataxia. Finally Weber syndrome where you have third nerve palsy with contralateral hemiplegia. So very easy to remember a mnemonic is where 
एन बी सी डब्ल्यू रिमेम्बर नाइस ब्यूटिफुल क्यूट वाइफ नाइस ब्यूटिफुल क्यूट वाइफ एन फॉर नॉर्थ एंगल बी फॉर बेनेडिक्स ब्यूटिफुल सी फॉर क्यूट दैट इज क्लॉथ डब्ल्यू वाइफ दैट इज वेबर सिंड्रोम सो नाइस ब्यूटिफुल क्यूट वाइफ इफ यू रिमेम्बर यू कैन रिमेम्बर ऑल दीज फोर सिंड्रोम then another important syndrome in midbrain is perinot syndrome i told in previous class of neuroophthalmology where i discussed that the vertical gaze has got two components up gaze and down gaze up gaze fibers cross over and then descend down gaze fibers descend straight away so if anything goes and impinges on the midbrain the top of the midbrain like perinot syndrome you have selective up gaze palsy so perinot syndrome and another two important points which you need to know when you are talking about midbrain syndromes are one third nerve nucleus involvement third nerve involvement third nerve nucleus involvement how do you differentiate between third nerve nucleus non that means in the midbrain per se and third nerve fascicle involvement in third nerve fascicle involvement the levator palpebrae superiors on one side gets affected so you may have unilateral ptosis but If the brainstem per se gets affected, if the third nerve nucleus gets affected, you'll have bilateral ptosis because the levator palpebrae superiors on both sides gets a common supply from the centrally placed nucleus in the third nerve nucleus. So the third nerve nucleus in the midbrain gets affected. Then both the levator palpebrae superiors are affected. So patient will have bilateral ptosis. But once the nerve emerges from the nucleus and goes peripherally only there will be unilateral ptosis so bilateral ptosis it is a third nerve nuclear involvement in the midbrain very important point and then i discussed this in the last class third nerve you have the parasympathetic fibers going going superficially so for any extrinsic pathology like posterior communicating artery aneurysm or herniation will affect the superficially placed parasympathetic fibers and therefore since parasympathetic causes constriction of the pupil there will be dilatation of the pupil whereas if it's an intrinsic pathology of the third nerve like diaphysis it affects the center of the third nerve and therefore spares the superficially placed parasympathetic fibers so these are all the points you should you need to know in midbrain north angle syndrome benedict syndrome clot syndrome weber syndrome perinot syndrome how do you differentiate between the third nerve nuclear involvement from the third nerve involvement how do you differentiate between the extrinsic compression of the third nerve from the intrinsic pathology of the third nerve so midbrain is over now let's go to the pons pons basically you need to know about foveal foveal syndrome and milliard gubler syndrome what is foveal syndrome foveal syndrome like as i said about the third nerve nucleus and the third nerve foveal syndrome is a sixth nerve nuclear involvement whereas milliard gubler is sixth nerve fascicular involvement so the sixth now is sixth nuclear involvement is there sixth now nucleus has got two components one one intra intra second is inter intra means it connects only the sixth now on the same side inter means it connects the sixth now on the same side with the third now on the opposite side through mlf so in the sixth now nucleus gets affected both the intra component and the inter component gets affected inter nuclear component gets affected so they have gaze palsy so if sixth nerve nucleus gets affected sixth nerve on one side and third nerve on the opposite side gets affected so they'll have horizontal gaze palsy with seventh nerve and opposite hemiplegia that is foveal syndrome whereas milliard gubler syndrome it is the sixth nerve which gets affected so unlike horizontal gaze which you see in foveal syndrome only the lateral rectus gets affected so sixth nerve palsy causing lateral rectus palsy with seventh nerve palsy and hemiplegia is milliard gubler syndrome so the fundamental difference between milliard gubler syndrome and foveal syndrome is foveal syndrome sixth nerve nucleus gets affected so intra nuclear part and inter nuclear part gets affected so it produces a horizontal gaze palsy whereas milliard gubler produces only sixth nerve palsy so only lateral rectus palsy with other components like seventh nerve palsy and contralateral hemiplegia right then what is locked in syndrome and what is one and half syndrome locked in syndrome and one and half syndrome in locked in syndrome what happens the lesion is in the pons so as i said sixth nerve nucleus and perf pont and paramedian reticular formation are concerned with gaze and therefore when a locked in syndrome what happens is that the horizontal gaze gets affected corticobulbar fibers and corticospinal gets affected so they'll have quadriplegia but midbrain is intact so they'll have vertical eye movements 
So locked in syndrome is a pontine infarct or pontine pathology where there is a horizontal gaze palsy, quadriparesis, but vertical eye movements are present. That is locked in syndrome. Then what is one and a half syndrome? As I said, PPRF is, is responsible for one movement, horizontal movement, and MLF is responsible for half movement. So if there is a combined lesion of PPRF and MLF, one movement and half movement are gone and there is only half movement present and that too there is nystagmus because of Herring's law of dual innervation. What is Herring's law of dual innervation? Yoke muscles get the same supply. That means right lateral rectus and left middle rectus or left lateral rectus or right middle rectus. So when the left middle rectus gets affected, there is compensatory increase in the stimulus from the corresponding yoke muscles. So right lateral rectus there will be nystagmus, abducting nystagmus. So this is locked in syndrome, you have one and a half syndrome, you have Fowell syndrome and miller gubler syndrome. So this is all about, you need to know about pons. Now coming to the medulla oblongata. Medulla oblongata basically you have two syndromes. One the lateral medullary syndrome, second is the medial medullary syndrome. If you understand medial medullary syndrome, lateral medullary syndrome is easy. Medial medullary syndrome basically has got two components. One the posterior column, second is the twelfth nerve. So posterior column and twelfth nerve are affected. Are affected along with the along with the pyramidal tract. That is, it is a medial medullary syndrome. Whereas in lateral medullary syndrome, you have other components getting affected. For example, spinal nucleus of the fifth sensory nucleus of the fifth nerve gets affected. So they'll have facial sensory loss. The spinothalamic tract gets affected. So they'll have the contralateral loss of pain and temperature. They have sympathetic tract gets affected. So they'll have Horner syndrome. They have spinocerebellar tract getting affected, so they have ataxia. The tenth nerve gets affected, so they have parietal palsy and dysphagia. The vestibular nucleus gets affected, so they have severe vertigo. In fact, any person coming with severe vertigo always suspect Wallenberg syndrome. One of the common causes of vertigo in of a brainstem pathology is Wallenberg syndrome. Another important MCQ question and another important concept you need to know about Wallenberg syndrome is that. Wallenberg syndrome or lateral medullary syndrome does not produce hemiplegia. It does not produce hemiplegia. Why? Pyramidal tract is medially situated. Whereas Wallenberg, Wallenberg syndrome is a lateral medullary syndrome and therefore it does not affect pyramidal tract or corticospinal tract. So hemiplegia is not a feature of Wallenberg syndrome. So, so far I've been telling so many points you must have got confused. Now let me really summarize with a super fascinating rule which is known as rule of four. So if you know rule of four, you will know the entire brainstem strokes. Such a simple but superb rule, the rule of four. So what is rule of four? According to the rule of four, there are four medial structures which starts with the letter M. According to the rule of four, there are four structures which start with S which are placed in the sideways S for S sideways for S medial or midline for M and there are four cranial nerves in each component four cranial nerves in medial oblongata four cranial nerves in pons and four cranial nerves above pons so very easy rule of four all four four midline structures M you have four M's four sideways structure for S you have four Track starting with S. You have four cranial nerves in each component. Four in the medial oblongata, four in the pons, and four above pons. So, what are the four M structures which are in the midline? One is the motor corticospinal tract. As I said, it is in the medial part of the medial oblongata. So, lateral medullary syndrome does not produce any pleasure. So, it indirectly says it is placed medially. So M is for medially. So what are the four M? One M is the corticospinal tract or the motor tract. Second is the medial meniscus or the posterior column. Third is the motor nuclei of cranial nerves are all in the center in the mid, in the medial part. And fourth is the MLF, medial longitudinal fasciculus. So you have four M in the midline. M for M, motor corticospinal tract, medial meniscus, posterior column. Motor roots of the cranial nerves and medial longitudinal fasciculus. Over. Now you have four S, four S in this sides. S for S. What are the four S? Spinothalamic tract which carries pain and temperature. You have sympathetic tract which can cause Horner syndrome. You have sensory nucleus of the fifth nerve that is laterally placed and therefore medial oblongata 
Sensory nucleus of the fifth nerve gets affected. Sensory loss is there. Spinothalamic tract gets affected. Therefore, you have the pain and temperature loss on the opposite side. Sympathetic tract gets affected. You can have Horner syndrome. And spinocerebellar tract gets affected. You can have ataxia. So 4S, S for S, 4S which are placed in the sides. Sympathetic tract, spinothalamic tract, spinocerebellar tract. And then you have the spinocerebellar tract. So spinothalamic tract. Sympathetic tract, sensory nucleus of the fifth nerve, and spinocerebellar tract. All these are placed sideways or laterally, and therefore, lateral medullary syndrome, Wallenberg syndrome, you have all these four structures getting affected. So, 4M, which are placed in the midline, M for M, 4S structures, which are placed in the sideways, S for S, no four cranial nerves. There are two important points. One, I said there are four cranial nerves in the medulla oblongata 9, 10, 11, 12. 4 cranial nerves in the pons, 5, 7, 8 and 6 and 4 cranial nerves above pons, 3, 4 in the midbrain, 1, 2 is above. So, you have 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. But again, here again, there is a very fascinating rule wherein they say that all the cranial nerves which are placed in the midline can divide 12 into equal parts. That means 3 and 4, 6 and 12, they are placed in the midline. 3 divides 12 into 4 parts. 4 divides 12 into equal 3 parts. 6 divides 12 into equal 2 parts. 12 divides 12 into 1 equal part. So all the cranial nerves which divide 12 into equal parts are placed in the midline centrally. That is 3, 4 in the pons, 6, 3, 4 in the midbrain, 6 in the pons and 12 in the middle oblongata. All the cranial nerves which do not divide 12 into equal parts are placed sideways. 5, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 5 cannot divide 12 into equal parts. Neither 7 nor 8 can divide 12 into equal parts. Neither 9, 10, 11 can divide 12 into equal parts. So the cranial nerves which do not divide 12 into equal parts are placed sideways. The cranial nerves which divide 12 into equal parts like 3, 4, 6, 12 are placed in the midline. So this is about the stroke syndromes and rule of 4. I hope you have enjoyed it as Dr. Uh, C.M. Fisher, the great neurologist said, you learn neurology stroke by stroke and hence if you have understood all these stroke syndromes, I think stroke by stroke you have learned and you have learned neurology. I enjoyed really teaching this uh, episode and I hope you also enjoyed. And if you really like it, please subscribe my channel Dr. Srinivas Concepts. Thank you. Bye.